Welcome to the story of Jonah, based on the Bible and recreated with artificial intelligence. Chapter 1. The Reluctant Prophet In the bustling streets of Gath Hefer, Jonah, son of Amittai, felt the familiar warmth of the sun on his face. The marketplace was alive with shouts of merchants, the laughter of children, and the scents of freshly baked bread and spices. Yet, amidst the typical humdrum, Jonah felt a disquiet that morning, a feeling he couldn't quite place. As he wandered through the winding alleys, trying to silence the unease within him, a voice deep and resonant pierced through his thoughts. It was the voice of God, familiar yet always overwhelming. Jonah, it began, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. The weight of the commandment bore down on him. Nineveh, the Assyrian stronghold, was notorious for its cruelty and wickedness. The stories he had heard of their ruthlessness sent shivers down his spine. Prophets were seldom welcomed warmly, and in a place like Nineveh, Jonah feared the worst. Instead of the determination that was expected of prophets, a seed of rebellion sprouted in Jonah's heart. Instead of travelling east towards Nineveh, he decided to escape God's gaze and head west. He would go to Tarshish far away from Nineveh, far away from his responsibilities. As the sun began its descent, painting the sky with shades of orange and purple, Jonah found himself at the Joppa port. The salty sea breeze tugged at his robes and ruffled his hair. Amidst the throng of sailors and merchants, he found a ship bound for Tarshish. Paying his fare, he boarded, hoping to bury his dread and responsibility in the vastness of the sea. The ship, sturdy and grand, bobbed gently, promising a journey of escape. Jonah felt relief wash over him as the shores of Joppa receded in the distance. Yet as night fell and he descended into the ship's hold, a storm of uncertainty raged in his heart. He questioned if he could truly run from God and whether the ocean's depths could shield him from divine duty. In the silent darkness below deck, surrounded by the creaking timber and the murmur of waves, Jonah closed his eyes, not foreseeing the tempest that awaited him. Chapter 2. Storms of Defiance The ship sailed smoothly for a time, its wooden boards groaning softly against the gentle push and pull of the waves. The initial anxiety that had gnawed at Jonah's heart gave way to a false sense of security as he nestled among the ship's cargo, seeking refuge in sleep. However, nature had other plans. Without warning, the skies turned ominous, and a great wind began to whip the Mediterranean Sea into a furious tempest. Massive waves clashed against the ship, tossing it violently. Panic ensued among the crew. Experienced sailors who had weathered many storms found themselves gripped by a fear they had never known. Cries rang out as they scrambled to jettison the cargo overboard, lightening the vessel in hopes of saving it from the wrath of the sea. Amidst the chaos, the ship's captain, a grizzled old man with salt in his beard, barked orders. But the storm seemed to mock their efforts, growing fiercer with each passing moment. Jonah, roused from his sleep by the tumult, realised with a sinking heart that the storm outside mirrored the turmoil within him. He felt an oppressive weight, understanding that his defiance was not just against God's directive, but against the very fabric of the universe. The sailors, desperate and seeking answers, began to pray to their gods, imploring them for mercy and intervention. But the tempest raged on. The captain, sensing a deeper reason for this unnatural storm, confronted Jonah. What have you done? For whose cause is this calamity upon us? Jonah, his face pale, swallowed hard and confessed, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Admitting his attempt to flee from God's command, he looked into the eyes of the terror-stricken sailors and said, It's because of me that this great storm has come upon you. The sailors, taken aback by the revelation and unable to comprehend such a profound divine discontent, debated their next steps. They questioned Jonah, seeking a solution. What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? With a heavy heart, Understanding the magnitude of his defiance and wanting to spare the innocent crew, Jonah declared, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. The men hesitated, unwilling to commit such an act. They strained at the oars, attempting to row back to shore. But nature's fury was relentless. And with heavy hearts, realising the inevitable, they cried out to Jonah's God for forgiveness lifting Jonah and casting him into the surging abyss. 
The sea, as if satisfied, immediately grew calm, leaving the sailors in awe. They offered sacrifices and made vows to the Lord, their prior gods forgotten amidst the profound realisation of his power. Below the now placid surface, Jonah, enveloped in darkness, began a descent deeper than he could have ever imagined, into the belly of a waiting behemoth. The storm may have ceased, but Jonah's ordeal was far from over. Chapter 3. The Belly of Despair As Jonah plunged into the sea's depths, the world around him became a whirl of bubbles and darkness. The cold waters embraced him, and for a brief moment he felt a suffocating weightlessness. But before he could be pulled further down by the waters of the deep, something immense and fleshy closed around him. Swallowed whole, Jonah found himself in a realm unlike any other. The air was humid and suffocating, and the walls around him pulsated. It was as if he had been cast into a living prison, an otherworldly space between life and death. In the utter blackness, time lost its meaning. With each passing moment, Jonah's initial shock gave way to a profound despair. The physical discomfort was pressing, the warm, thick air was hard to breathe, and the acrid smell of digestive juices was overwhelming, but it was the weight of his actions, the enormity of his disobedience, and the realisation of his predicament that bore down on him the heaviest. Lonely in the belly of the great fish, Jonah's thoughts swirled. Memories of home, his life's purpose, and the commandment he had tried to flee from all came rushing back. The darkness was not just around him, but within him, a reflection of his defiance, his doubts and his despair. But as the hours turned into days, a transformation began to unfold within Jonah's heart. The depth of his predicament led him to profound introspection. In the isolation of the great fish's belly, there were no more distractions, no more routes of escape. There was only Jonah and his creator. In his darkest hour, with genuine contrition, Jonah turned to God in prayer. He recounted his distress, acknowledging God's righteous judgment and expressing his yearning for the Lord's temple and presence. With faith rekindled, he declared, Salvation comes from the Lord. It was a prayer not just of repentance, but of profound realisation and surrender. Jonah understood that one cannot flee from the omnipresent, one cannot hide from one's purpose. God, in his boundless mercy, heard Jonah's sincere plea. After three days and three nights, echoing a divine pattern that would become significant in the scriptures, the great fish, directed by the hand of God, approached a shoreline. With a forceful heave, it expelled Jonah onto dry land. Coughing, drenched and humbled, Jonah lay on the shore, the sun's rays warming his skin and the sounds of the world returning to his ears. The dark belly of despair was behind him, but ahead lay the path of obedience, second chances and a mission he could no longer ignore. Chapter 4. Nineveh Awaits Emerging from the depths of his ordeal, Jonah, still bearing the salty remnants of his maritime prison, stood up shakily, sand clinging to his robes. Before him, the vast expanse of the horizon stretched out, marking both an end and a beginning. Behind him the sea murmured its age-old tales, but for Jonah its most recent story was the most transformative. Having faced the unimaginable consequences of his defiance, Jonah now bore a renewed spirit and an undeniable sense of purpose. The gravity of God's call resounded in him with even greater clarity. He must go to Nineveh. The journey to the Assyrian capital was neither short nor easy. As he journeyed, Jonah pondered on the message he was to deliver. Nineveh was an imposing city, renowned for its grandeur and also its wickedness. Its walls had heard the cries of countless victims, and its streets bore the shadows of its people's transgressions. How would such a city receive the word of a foreign prophet? Upon his arrival, Jonah was immediately struck by Nineveh's vastness. The city's high walls loomed above him, and its gates bore intricate carvings of its many conquests. The hum of life was everywhere, merchants hawking their goods, children playing in the courtyards, and nobles parading their wealth. But Jonah was undeterred. Drawing a deep breath, he began his divinely ordained mission. In forty days Nineveh will be overthrown, he proclaimed, his voice echoing through the bustling streets. His words, bold and unyielding, cut through the daily clamour, planting seeds of introspection in the hearts of all who heard. As days passed, Jonah's proclamation rippled throughout Nineveh. From the lowliest beggar to the highest noble, his words became the talk of the town. People whispered in hushed tones, 
contemplating their actions and the impending judgment. In a testament to the power of genuine repentance, the city began to transform. The once indifferent and haughty citizens of Nineveh began to fast, wear sackcloth, and mourn their past actions. This wave of penance reached even the royal palace, and the king himself decreed a city-wide fast, urging his subjects to call on God and renounce their wicked ways. The mighty city, which once stood as a testament to human pride and cruelty, was now a spectacle of humility. Its streets, where sin had once paraded without shame, now witnessed earnest prayers and heartfelt cries for mercy. And in the midst of this vast metropolis, Jonah watched, a mix of astonishment and hope in his eyes. Nineveh, it seemed, was on the brink of a new dawn. But for Jonah, this transformation would bring about reflections and challenges of its own. Chapter 5. A City Transformed. The sun, a burning orb, cast its golden hues over Nineveh, illuminating its streets, squares and buildings in a light that felt almost sanctified. But this was a different Nineveh. The sounds of laughter, revelry and the din of commerce were subdued, replaced by murmured prayers, cries of repentance and a stillness that was palpable. From the highest terraces to the bustling markets, sackcloth replaced fine linens and ashes marked foreheads that once wore crowns of gold and silver. The king's decree had galvanised the entire city into action. Every person, from the greatest to the least, sought to turn from their wicked ways, hoping against hope that the god of Jonah would relent from the disaster he had proclaimed. The very air in Nineveh seemed charged with anticipation and apprehension. Children, sensing the gravity of the moment, clung closer to their parents. Animals too partook in the fast, their usual sounds of life muted by the city-wide decree. Jonah, the lone prophet in this vast metropolis, observed the transformation with a complex mix of emotions. Part of him was gratified, even astounded, by the sheer scale of the repentance. Such a wicked city, changing its ways so completely upon hearing the word of the Lord, it was nothing short of miraculous. Yet another part of Jonah wrestled with darker feelings. He had always known of God's boundless compassion, but to witness it firsthand bestowed upon a city that had been a symbol of ruthlessness and cruelty stirred something within him. Could such a rapid transformation be genuine? Would God truly spare this city that had been a scourge to so many? As the days wore on and the fortieth day approached, Jonah decided to venture outside the city walls. He climbed a vantage point, building a small shelter for himself, and sat under its shade, waiting and watching, eager to see what would become of Nineveh. And as he watched, the unexpected happened. God, in his infinite mercy and boundless love, saw the genuine repentance of the Ninevites and relented. No disaster befell the city, no fire rained from the sky, no ground trembled beneath. Nineveh, against all odds, stood redeemed. Yet instead of rejoicing at this remarkable turn of events, Jonah found himself grappling with bitterness and resentment. The depth of his emotions would take him on yet another journey, one that would test his understanding of grace, mercy and divine love. Chapter 6 The Shade and the Worm East of Nineveh, atop a barren hill, Jonah sat, his gaze fixed upon the city that sprawled beneath him. The shelter he constructed provided little comfort from the searing sun, but it wasn't the heat that troubled Jonah's heart. It was the unchecked turmoil of emotions raging within him. God's mercy towards Nineveh had ignited a fire of anger and confusion in Jonah. Was it not for this very reason that I fled to Tarshish, he lamented. I knew you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. As the day wore on, the sun's intensity grew. The desert winds carried no solace, only sand and heat. Jonah's discomfort was both physical and spiritual, and he longed for relief. As if in answer to his silent plea, a large leafy plant miraculously sprouted beside him, growing rapidly to provide shade over his head. The coolness it offered was like a balm, and Jonah felt a temporary relief from his discomfort. But God's lessons for Jonah were not over. With the dawn of a new day, a worm appeared at the base of the plant, gnawing away until the once lush and leafy plant withered and died. The respite Jonah had enjoyed was snatched away, and once again he was exposed to the harsh elements. The scorching wind and the relentless sun beat down on Jonah, and his misery deepened. It would be better for me to die than to live, he exclaimed in his anguish. 
It was then that God, in his boundless wisdom, posed a question to Jonah. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Jonah, with a mixture of defiance and despair, replied, It is. I'm so angry I wish I were dead. God's response was gentle yet profound. You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? The weight of God's words settled upon Jonah. The withering plant, the scorching sun, the worm, all were part of a divine tapestry designed to teach Jonah about the boundless compassion of God, a compassion that extended not just to a single prophet, but to an entire city, and indeed the world. In the vast desert landscape, with Nineveh's towers piercing the horizon, Jonah was left to ponder the magnitude of God's mercy, the breadth of his love, and the depth of his grace. This concludes our story of Jonah. Check out the rest of the content created by Bible Intelligence.